brown the goose uh, in, in this Dutch oven uh, that you see here on the stove. And you'll get all this from the recipe when he gets around to showing it to you, but I'm going to add now, since my goose is brown, I'm going to add a uh, full medium onion that are chopped up rather coarsely. And uh, while these onions are sort of uh, cooking tender here and beginning to brown just a little bit, because I got another step in just a couple of minutes, uh, I want to talk about the man that wrote the cookbook uh, that this recipe came from. Uh, it's called Treasury of Wine and Wine Cooker. It was given to me not too long ago by some friends of mine uh, who lived down in Greenville, North Carolina. It was written by Mr. Grayton Taylor. And uh, this recipe came from it. I've cooked many, many uh, recipes by Mr. Taylor. Uh, the lady that gave me this uh, is, is a Ellen Taylor Flanagan, at Taylor Wine Company. And of course, I'm going to use Taylor Wine in the recipe for the burgundy here because it wouldn't be fair if, uh, out of uh, Mr. Taylor's book not to use Taylor Wine. Uh, but uh, Grayton Taylor uh, is no longer with us. Uh, he's dead. Uh, he was uh, Ellen Flanagan. Uh, Ellen Taylor Flanagan's father, and uh, she and her husband, Graham Flanagan, who owns Sea Ox Boats down at Greenville, are both very good friends of mine, but I've cooked many recipes out of this book. Now, I've got lots of cookbooks in my library, uh, but not many are, are in my collector's shelf of my library. Not many of them are, are over in the rare book collect. If you can find one of these, the copyright on this book was 1963, and in those days it sold for $6.95, and in 1963, $6.95 is a lot of money. You pay 17 or 18 or $20 for a hardbound cookbook uh, of this quality now, but uh, if you can find one of these somewhere, uh, pick it up because it, it's an excellent uh, book and it's all about cooking with wine, which I do a great deal of. Uh, when you use wine, of course, the alcohol boils away and uh, you have just the essence of it left. But Mr. Taylor uh, was a great gourmand, uh, gourmet, uh, wrote cookbooks, invented recipes, uh, had his own vineyards, and uh, it's a good cookbook and I recommend it very much. Now, I, my onions here are, are beginning to get close to being right, but they need to go a couple more minutes. So what we're going to do here in the interest of time, uh, Mr. Clarence Williams up in the director's booth, we're going to pause here for about two minutes and then we'll be back after these important... Okay, my onions are cooked here uh, in the oil with the, with the disjointed brown pieces of goose. And I'm going to add just a couple of tablespoons of flour, house archery, of course. Uh, that's going to go in here to be a thickener. And I'm going to turn it down because we're now fixing to get into the simmer stage. We'll cook this until the goose is tender. And you'll be able to tell just by putting a knife through what normally would be one of the tougher parts, which would be the leg, either the sharp point of a knife or, or, or a sharp fork. Uh, barbecue kind of fork, you know what I mean, the ones with the long tines. Uh, but what we're going to do here now is uh, stir this up. I've got to get my spoon over here and let this thicken just a little bit. And I've got my burgundy and my vegetables that go together to make Great and Taylor's Spanish goose. Okay. And to it, we're going to add all the rest of the ingredients. We've got two sliced tomatoes. And we've got about four small, or, or if they're real small, maybe five uh, sliced red potatoes. Peel them if you like. If you'd rather have them peeled, uh, that's up to you. Put them in there. I've got a can of chicken stock. The recipe calls for one and a half cups of chicken stock. That would actually be uh, 12 ounces, if, if I, I remember my my high school figures right, but uh, 10 and 3 quarter ounce can is enough. They don't make things in ounces anymore. They make them, make them in liters and then they call them ounces or milliliters or whatever they are. But a can and a half of chicken broth or stock, make your own stock if you like, and 3 quarters of a cup of the burgundy and salt it to taste. And we're going to let it cook about an hour and a half, just simmer on low, so we won't have a chance to see what the finished product is going to taste like. Uh, I'll try to get back to you in a little bit, maybe let you get a look at it, but it's just, uh, it, it's, as you can already see, uh, it's a kind of a stew, a goose stew, but it's Spanish style because of the vegetables that are in it and the wine 
and everything good like that there. So there we go. We're going to cover it and let it simmer for just a few minutes. Uh, that goose, as I say, came from Delaware. I think I was telling you uh, last week, if you were here, and if you weren't, I'm sorry, we missed you. But last week, uh, I was telling you about, I, I had a week-long trip on the Delmarva Peninsula, during which I hunted Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware, all on that eastern shore peninsula, that big peninsula that borders the eastern side of Chesapeake Bay up there. And I spent two days hunting in Delaware. Now, the mail that we've gotten from Delaware has amazed me. I never really considered Delaware part of the Southern Sportsman Territory when I added Maryland to what we call uh, the Southern Sportsman area. But I added Maryland uh, three or four years ago and we went on in Salisbury, Maryland on WBOC television up there. And all of a sudden I started getting all this mail from Delaware and I said, where's this stuff coming from? So I looked it up on the map uh, and it's only about five miles from Salisbury, Maryland to Delaware. And a large part of their viewing audience is out of Delaware, and I've made some great friends up there, including one you're going to meet today, Don Moore, who is from Seaford, Delaware. And I have met him at these sporting goods uh, shows and exhibitions and things like that because he's generally, at most of them, as many as he can make because he's an art dealer. And I bought some books from him and some paintings. So we're going up to Delaware now to hunt with a couple of guys from up in that area. Uh, you're going to see Don Moore here uh, in just a minute. This is E.G. Adams from uh, Bridgeville, and uh, his companion he's hunting with, both these guys are guides. Uh, the other guy is Dennis Lineweaver. And we're hunting uh, sort of an unusual kind of hunt with uh, about a hundred full-size mounted actual goose decoys. In other words, these were geese that were shot and then uh, they were mounted and they were put on boards. They were mounted in all the various positions of geese when they're out in the field. And uh, they're taken out and, and used as decoys. And that's a uh, quite common practice in Maryland and Delaware in recent years. They make far and away the best. Uh, now, this is Don Moore. The decoys make far and away the best decoys that I have, uh, have ever hunted over. There's no doubt but what the birds are attracted to them. And uh, the birds were flying real good. This was one of those hot mornings in December, if you remember the week before Christmas, how hot it was, and it was just as clear as a bell, and I was amazed that the birds were even flying at all, and right at dawn, they started flying. We're about uh, two miles here from Prime Hook National Wildlife Refuge in Delaware, and the birds just started to fly, and they kept flying, and they kept flying. Now, this is a Chesapeake, and his name, I think, is Jack. A real good hunting dog. I haven't hunted with many Chesapeake's. You usually hunt with labs, but this is a, a very handsome and a very smart, very intelligent dog. He belongs to E.G. E.G. Adams and Dennis Lyon Weaver are both uh, guides up there. They've just gone into the guiding business, just gotten some uh, farm acreage that they have the use of, and they hunt with these decoys, and they work. Now, because of the breeze and everything else, they had put them out before daylight. A lot of these birds were coming in and they were lighting way outside of the decoys. So a time or two, they went out to rearrange them, change them around so they could get them placed like they wanted to get them placed. Uh, and that's what you see, a little activity here in the field of moving the decoys around. However, somebody shot that goose and Jack's bringing him in to EG. E.G.'s from Bridgeville. I'm going to give you his name and his address here in just a minute. But the birds were really flying that morning. And like most guides, again, we're moving a few decoys around. And they moved them kind of hurriedly because the birds were just flying all over the place. And we wanted them to decoy in closer to us. They were decoying in 50, 75, or 80 yards outside of the decoys. And we were trying to get them on in. But like most guides up there that I've run into in Maryland and Virginia and up through there, uh, Delaware now, they don't like to shoot big bunches. They prefer to shoot small bunches uh, because uh, you spook them. When you shoot, see a bunch like this, a drove, uh, it's just better to let them pass on because chances are some singles and some doubles or threes and fours and a few birds like that are gonna come in. However, one bunch came in and they all raised up and shot and four birds hit the ground and I said, slow down guys, I'm, I'm trying to get pictures here and we're gonna have the limit before I have time to get all the film I want. This is Dennis Lineweaver. And in the near foreground there is E.G. Adams. We're hunting with Don Moore. 
uh, who, I, as I say, I have known several years, and he has set me up several of these trips up there. In fact, he set up all the trips that I went on when I spent a week up there on the Delmarva Peninsula. Probably the greatest waterfowl concentration in the world, or certainly the greatest concentration of waterfowl here. This was the bunch where they came in, and uh, they took four of them right out of the air. But beautiful hunting, and when they come in like this, we just get up and shoo them on. That bunch came in, and we just stood up in the blind and started taking pictures and shoot them out uh, because we didn't want to shoot bunches this big. It sort of uh, scares them away. But I'm going to give you a closer look of the decoys here now. Bear in mind that, that each one of these is a mounted bird, a taxidermed bird. And they're very valuable, and, and they're fragile, delicate, of course, uh, more delicate than a plastic or a wooden decoy, so they have to have uh, much more care taken of them, or putting them out in the field, taking them back up. But they're full-bodied, mounted decoys, and uh, the birds come to them better than any other kind of decoys I've ever seen, the Canada geese I'm talking about. Now, last week, if you were watching us, we had snow geese coming to napkins. We just spread napkins all over the ground, about a 1,000 of them, and the snow geese just flew in and landed all in the middle of them. Uh, if you're interested in hunting up there next season, you want to make reservations now. It's an excellent hunt. It's E.G. Adams of Bridgeville, Delaware. The area code is 302. Call area code 302 and information. Ask the operator for E.G. Adams' phone number in Bridgeville, Delaware, or just drop him a card in Bridgeville, Delaware, and he'll send you one of his brochures. Uh, that was a great hunt. I enjoyed that very much. Don Moore, my friend at Delaware Sporting Gallery in Seaford, set up all these hunts for me, including the one I'm going to show you in just a minute, which is something I've never shown here on, on the show before, and that is a brant hunt, the American brant, which is, is uh, a small goose. It's a close relative of the goose, but I've never hunted brant before and filmed them here on the show, and so I'm going to show you what they are in just a minute. There's a strange story about brant. Uh, it used to be absolutely the most delicious bird, eating-wise, a uh, hundred years ago I'm talking about. It was the choice, back when guys commercially hunted uh, and everything, it was the choice bird of all. Uh, it belongs to the goose family. I'm going to show you a picture here in just a minute. I'm just kind of browsing through my book. This is my Sports and Field Treasury of Waterfowl, and it's out of my more or less rare collection of, of, uh, of books that, that I have. This one is copyrighted 1957 and was given to me many Christmases ago. Uh, it says to Junior from Pop and Mom. My mom and dad uh, gave me this, and it's got all the birds in here, the waterfowl in, in various colors. But I thought I'd show you the brant. Now, there are two brant. There's a black brant and there's the American brant. The black brant is mostly uh, Pacific Coast brant. It's mostly just by accident that you'll find one on the Atlantic coast. The American brant, which is this one down here, the one with the whiter looking breast, up here at the top, these two top birds are the black brant. You don't see many of these along the Atlantic seaboard. But you see a great many of these. Now, when they're eating what they like is their choice food, which is eelgrass and grain and things like that, they're absolutely the most delicious eating bird in the world. Uh, the problem is the eelgrass has died off in recent years, and they've started eating things like skunk cabbage and all that sort of stuff. And so you're liable to shoot one that doesn't taste so good. If you got my recipe last year, where I, I mean last week, where I filleted out the, the redhead breast and marinated them, uh, you might want to do that with the brand if you get one. You can generally tell when you open a bird up from the way the body cavity smells, whether he's been eating a lot of oysters or anything like that, but you can generally get the odor and you can tell. I can open a bird up and I can tell you whether I need to do something special to it in the way of a sauce or whether I need to skin it or whatever or whether I can just eat it just like it is. It'll smell like whatever it is uh, that it's been eating. Well, the brant is a spectacular shooting bird and we're going to take you now to the Indian River State Docks uh, at Indian River near Milford, Delaware. We're hunting today with uh, Don Moore, uh, my friend from uh, Delaware Sporting Gallery. This is a look of the docks, and of course in the wintertime in December in Delaware, there are not that many uh, summertime boats hanging around. Most of the snowbirds have gone to Miami or wherever. Uh, the guy we're hunting with is named Rick Carney, and he's got his dog along, along named Buckshot. You're gonna meet Buckshot in a minute. Buckshot is a super. He's another one of the best friends I ever made. We went out early in the morning and set out a spread of decoys, mostly broad bills of scarf. You don't necessarily need decoys for brand. They'll, they'll decoy to almost anything. Now, uh, this is a special boat blind. If you notice all that stuff piled up there in the middle of the boat, you're going to see here in a minute, the birds were flying very early before we even got the uh, boat camouflaged. A bunch flew over 
and one of them bit the dust, but while Buckshot was going after him, we're getting the blind ready. Uh, it's just made up sides of grass that match the brown grass that you see there in the background, the marsh grass, and these clip onto the sides of the boat. You pull the boat up on the shore into the grass, and you hang these uh, slats or whatever you want to call on the side of the boat, uh, and then it becomes a blind, and then you get in the blind, uh, and that's, uh, that's what it is. Uh, all kinds of ingenious rigs that guys uh, use to camouflage themselves to try to hide themselves from a duck. Uh, a lot of people who study animal behavior, uh, doctors, psychologists, uh, parapsychologists, whoever, will tell you that a duck has a small brain and therefore must not be so smart, but a duck hunter will tell you that he can be outwitted by a duck quite often. And when he comes along and figures out some way to outwit the duck, he feels triumphant as though he's a step above the normal humanoid in intelligence. That's Don Moore, you see here on this side of us, Rick Carney in the back of the boat, and here come the Brant. Now the Brant is a larger bird. It, it is uh, not as large as a Canada goose. A couple came in here, and uh, we had to shoo them out. They lit right in. Uh, they will come, they'll tow right on into other decoys. He's about the size of a very large mallard, about two and a half or three pounds. Uh, three and a half pounds is a very large one, whereas you get into seven or eight or nine pounds dressed weight I'm talking about for a Canada goose. But when they have been eating good food, they are delicious. And like every other waterfowl I know, when they are eating something that is not good uh, tasting to you, uh, they're going to take on the taste of whatever they've been eating, and so they're not quite so delicious. This is old buckshot. A couple of our birds fell so far out, they were shot and fell, flew a while and then fell so far out, the tide was really sweeping through here. For those of you who are geographically oriented, this is a sort of a drain or a gut that connects Rehoboth Bay in Delaware to Indian River. And of course, Indian River flows out, uh, Indian River Inlet, right there north of Ocean City, Maryland. But we're right where Rehoboth Bay flows into the Indian River and the tide, where, there's a small island there right in the middle of that drain, and the tide on both sides of that island was quite swift. And uh, there was a time or two there when we wouldn't let Buckshot go for the birds because they were so far out, we knew he would just keep swimming, and if he didn't find the bird turn around, he might swim over the horizon, end up somewhere in Alaska or wherever. So a time or two, we wouldn't let him go, but he's a marvelous retriever. A very intelligent dog, and of course I have a soft spot in my heart for dogs. Uh, but we're going after a bird or two now that we shot. We would just mark them and we'd say, okay, we won't let him go for that one. We'll, we'll go after him a minute in the boat. And we'd go down the tide, and sure enough, in a minute, you spot the bird floating there. Old Buckshot's got him spotted already. The American Brant. A choice eating bird when he has been eating on fine vegetation and other good tasting stuff like that there, like any other duck, a merganser or a scoter or a sea duck or anything else, not quite so good when he's been eating oysters and clams and minnows and other animal matter. But fun to hunt in any case. You can see civilization there in the background. We're, we're just hunting right here, right off the inland waterway, really but good shooting, uh, a generous bag limit. These birds are not in danger, and there's, as you can see here, a nice flock of them going by, but the daily bag limit in Delaware is four birds per man per day. That was a little buffle head that came in. We got a couple of buffle heads, uh, a broad bill or two, and I finally took up the shotgun. I hadn't shot a brant in so long, I couldn't hardly remember it, so I shot a little bit, and uh, I shot three of them. Uh, I enjoy it when I've gotten some film and I want to do it. Don Moore, I handed him the camera and I said, here, take my picture while I shoot this bird. Uh, he also took a picture too of what I shot at but did not shoot the bird and I have, of course, deleted that. I don't want you to see me missing. Uh, I seldom miss. Say 20% of the time I hit, that is, uh, or whatever. I enjoy uh, waterfowl hunting, especially, I guess, of all sports. Duck hunting is my favorite. But I enjoyed that trip that I took up to the Del Marva Peninsula. I hunted four different ways up there, four different styles of blind, four different kinds of birds, snow geese, Canada geese, a diving ducks down in Virginia, redheads and camasbacks and things like that, and the brant uh, that you just saw here. And I'm looking forward to getting up there. In fact, I can't hardly wait. 
until next waterfowl season. I'll be back here in a minute with a final word after this. One qu last quick look here at the stew. It's still simmering long. It'll be about an hour before it's done. It'll be done when it's tender. You stick a fork uh, into one of the hind legs, which is the toughest part. That's all the time we have. We'll see you here next week. Please do not let her do yourself a favor. Take her kid fishing. The Southern Sportsman has been brought to you in part by House Autry, proven cornmeal and flour products. The Southern Sportsman Game and Seafood Restaurant, the best food from field and ocean. And by Long Haul Jeans, the most comfortable jeans you will ever wear. <laughs>